I think the sense is that the worst of COVID-19 pandemic is over. But to be perfectly honest, my gut feeling is that we probably got to sit out the rest of this year. That means 2021. I think that it will be at least 8 to 12 months before everything will go back to the usual, to the normal. But I thank God for this. I think it's a good thing because God is extending to us the chance for us to reset, to uh, renew, to be revived, to have the pause button in place and to reevaluate where we are right now and get us ready for the next season for another move of God. In the 1980s, in the early 1980s, I was in Bible school and I just finished my NS. And one day I remember an elderly lecturer from New Zealand and he was speaking to the class. He said, students, you have never seen revival, but I have. And I can tell you right now, you must believe God for it. But if you want to be ready for revival, you must start preparing for it. You must study the Bible like you have never studied. You must get to know the Word of God and learn to pray and move in the Spirit and grow in your spiritual storehouse. Because when revival hits, you're going to be so busy, you won't have time to seek God in prayer and study because you'll be all the time winning the loss, following up on the new converts, and then be planning evangelistic programs and doing church planting and global missions. Well, you got to prepare by building up your spiritual storehouse. Build up the storehouse of the word, of prayer, of the anointing. Now, there were about 120 of us in the Bible school, but I really took his word very seriously. This must be 1983, 84. 1986, boom, revival hit and my ministry was launched. We see a lot of young people coming to Christ, and true enough, what he said came to pass. I was so busy. I had very little time to study some more and pray some more. I was so glad I built up my storehouse. Three years later, 1989, boom, City Harvest Church got started. For the first seven years, hundreds and hundreds of people came to Christ. And I again applied what he taught us in Bible school. We studied the Bible. We start to learn how to pray, how to worship. We build up our spiritual storehouse of God's Word, of the anointing, of learning how to uh, grow in faith and move in the Spirit. 1996, seven years later, revival hit again. We were in Hollywood theater. From a few hundred members, we grew to the thousands and then the tens of thousands. Many of you are here today and you were the result of that second wave of revival. Those seven years of preparation from 89 to 95, it propelled us to all that God has done all the way to 2010 and sustained us through the challenges and difficulties of the last decade. Seven years of inner strengthening for 24 years of tremendous revival and global mission. And I got a sensing as your senior pastor that another move of God, another wave of revival is around the corner. I just sense this, it's just near the horizon. With COVID-19, God is pressing the pause button, the reset button for us. He's preparing us for the next wave. I believe a third wave of revival is coming. Every new move of God requires a new illumination, a new revelation, a greater and deeper knowledge of who God is and what God wants to do. So I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. Those of you watching online at home, I want you to open up your Bible, all right? Whether it's an electronic or is it a physical Bible, open up to Ephesians 3 and verse 16. And here the Apostle Paul says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Now notice, this supernatural strength and might doesn't come automatically. God has to grant it to you. In other words, God can give you the permission to have it, or you can withhold the privilege from you. So it's according to how you respond. 
how we respond this year will determine what role and to what degree are we going to partake of the next move of God. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5 and verse 6. Now, two things over here. You must hunger and thirst. Now, in the kingdom of God, we, we learned this over the years. The more you eat, the hungrier you are. The more you drink, the more thirsty you'll be. So in this COVID-19 season, God is giving you and I a natural reason, a natural reason to be less busy, to be alone more, to be apart from other people more, and to go out less, to be shut off and be alone with God more. We have the natural excuse to grow in our spiritual hunger. We can eat of the Bible and grow in our knowledge and our understanding. Drinking has to do with the Holy Spirit. We have the natural excuse to spend more time lingering in the presence of the Spirit, in His power, in His presence. And the more you drink, the thirstier you're going to be. After 45 years as a Christian, can I tell you this? I don't have enough of the Holy Spirit. The more I drink of Him, the thirstier I am. I have an insatiable yearning for more of God's presence and more of the Spirit's power. And that's why every single week, I intentionally put myself at a place to expect and see God's miracle. Every week, even during the COVID, you'll find me doing hospital visitation because I want to pray for the seriously sick. I want to pray for those that are struggling in cancer. I want to see cancer healed. I want to see the oppressed set free from demonic powers. Every day I say, do it again, oh God. Do it again in my life. Let there be more of you and less of me. Let there be more presence and more glory and more power. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled. Now, how many of you are hungry and still thirsty for the Lord? Just wave your hands. If that's you, just give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Amen. But there's a second thing over here in this verse. There is a focus. Now, He's not asking you just to be hungry and thirsty for power, for presence, for glory, for miracles. He's saying you be hungry and thirsty for righteousness. Now, so the second thing here is this. Are you hungry and thirsty for His righteousness? Now, power is the evidence of the kingdom. But righteousness is the character. It's who He is. Righteousness is having the king in your life. If this righteousness is there, the power will be there. The miracles will be there. The blessings will be there. The breakthrough, the revival will be there. You see, so what Jesus really wants is a radical, complete, inner, total, moral transformation. He wants to see a real change in us so that we become more and more like Him. So while we are still in this pandemic, just a little bit longer, just maybe for another year, we mustn't waste 2021 away. Don't just sit around the premises waiting for the promises. You can't be, listen, we can't have another big day evangelistic event. I mean, it won't be sensitive, right? I mean, I cannot stand here and tell you, all right, guys, this is the vision for 2021. In three months' time, we're going to hire 1,000 buses. I want you to invite all your classmates and all your companies to come. It won't be sensitive. We cannot do marketplace, big events. We can't do global missions. Now, what we can't do externally, God is giving us a reason to focus on the internal. And I can tell you this, as a Christian for 45 years, the big challenge is never external. It's always internal. There are three very important things that i like you and our church to focus as our vision for 2021. This is our vision for the year. So I pray you listen very carefully because this will change your life, your cell group, and ultimately 
This, was, this will get us ready for the next revival that's around the corner. Number one, be intentional in cultivating Christ-likeness. Be very, very intentional in cultivating Christ-likeness. We must continue the first sermon I preached 14 months ago. I told you when I got out, the real purpose of being a Christian, the real purpose is not just so you become rich and famous and popular and your business is growing from, you know, from one business to five businesses, you become a millionaire or dream of being a billionaire. No, no, no. It's not being rich and wealthy. Your real purpose is not being famous and popular, having more followers on your social media. It's not just eating good food and drinking fine wine, wearing nice dresses and clothes, and jet setting around the world, vacationing from one place to another. Friends, let me tell you, your purpose in life is not even to get married and have children. See, listen, I told you, right from the first time I preached, after I got out, the chief end for every man and every woman is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is the first statement of Protestant Christianity, and it has not changed. Your chief end, your main purpose in life is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Jesus came and He said this, for this purpose I have come to glorify my Father. His purpose must be our purpose. So this week, as I fellowship, son reminded me in our time of devotion. She said, we are all created in the image of God. Everybody say, I'm created in the image of God. Now, what's the point? The point of an image is to image. The point of an image is to image. It is to display, to represent, to show forth. When you see images erected in the public, it is to represent the original. It is to reflect the original. It is to glorify the original. So God made you and I in His image so that the world will, have, will be filled with reflectors of who God is. So that there are billions and billions of replicas of God. Believers knowing God, loving God, showing forth who God is. So God wants to so transform us that when people see us, they see Jesus. And that is my dream. That is my highest aspiration. Every day when I come home from ministry, from work, I want my family to look at me and say, Jesus, it's like Jesus just walk in. When I go to the hospital to pray for somebody I don't want, I want the patients, the nurses to say, it's like Jesus, just walk in. My dream is that every time I see you and I stand on the stage, that you're sitting there and you will say, it's like Jesus was there listening, uh, speaking to me. You see, God wants to so transform us into Christ-likeness that when people see us, they immediately see Jesus Christ. To be a Christian is to be little Christ. That's why you're called Christian. Showing forth, reflecting Jesus. That is how we truly glorify God. And we don't need to second guess how to do this. Because the Bible gives us a whole list. It is called the nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. That is the character profile of who Jesus is. Remember, I make you memorize this. Can you still remember what the nine fruit of the Spirit? 14 months ago when I get, got out, the first thing I told you, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? I mean, you don't need to second guess. It's not like being some famous, successful celebrity or, or business people. It's not like being a hero in, in the kingdom of God. You want to be Christ-like. There's one list. It is a working list, a working checklist of our inner moral transformation. This is what the kingdom of God is really all about. 
Paul gives us the nine gifts in Galatians chapter 5. Then he shortened it in Romans 14 and verse 17. What did Paul say? He said, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So if you are aiming for righteousness, it's really a yearning to be transformed, to be more like Jesus. So to hunger and thirst for righteousness is to yearn for the character of Christ to be formed in us. For the last 12 months, our character was really, really tested. And some of you, maybe you're shocked by the way you responded. Without physical gatherings, how loving are we still toward God and toward one another? No cell group, no church services. Have you become sluggish in your love for God? You see, you get to see how loving you are. We are packed together like sardines in our apartment, in our flats, 24-7 a day. We get to see, our, we have never seen our, our husband or wife all day long like this. Our children, our parents, our in-laws, our outlaws, you know, we get to see them all the time. All of a sudden, your patience is tested. Your kindness your gentleness really, really got tested. Many struggled with mental health issues because all of a sudden they couldn't find joy and inner peace. And when people are stressed and they're frustrat frustrated, what happened? Tempers flare up. They lose control, no self-control. You end up quarreling, screaming, shouting, getting irritated. Someone wrote me a letter and said, Pastor, is it even possible for someone to cultivate the ninth fruit of the Spirit. Is it, is it, I mean, is it even possible? I mean, I thought it's automatic. It, if you have the Holy Spirit, you'll automatically come forth. No, 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 you are wrong. You see, you got the desire. You got to move in the direction. Jesus says, if you daily choose to love and you choose to forgive, the more you do this, the more the Holy Spirit can produce the fruit of love. If you learn to rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice, then the fruit of joy will come forth. If you make the effort, Ephesians 4, if you make the effort to maintain the bond of peace, only then will the fruit of peace be produced. So this year, 2021, you got to learn. I want every one of us to learn to be patient, more patient, to be kinder. Don't be easily irritated. Don't be angry. Learn to be forbearing and don't lose your temper again. You say, is it possible? The last time I, 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 I try my best, I try, because you know my history, I, I shared with, with you before. This was one of my weakness. By the grace of God, I have not lost my temper in the last four years. So I know it's possible. Not there yet, but I'm trying. By the grace of God, by the power of God, you don't, you don't give yourself the leeway that is your right to lose your temper. You make it a point. I'm going to be like Jesus. Jesus says, by your patience, possess your souls. Luke 21 verse 19. That means you can lose everything you hold dear. Moses experienced that. If you have no self-control over your emotions over the words you say, over your responses. If you can't manage and control your anger, you can lose everything. When you are stressed, and you will be, and we will all be, learn to be calm in your response. Learn not to be anxious. Trust God for the best possible outcome. Having done all, you stand. You trust don't be a negative, gossipy person. Don't let your mind be held captive by what you read and what you watch on social media. Learn to believe and, tr and hope for the best in everyone. Learn to think the best of people. See, be a kind, encouraging person. I, I put something on, on my screensaver, on my laptop. Every day, I want to be a positive, encouraging person. Every day, I want to say something positive to encourage the people in my family. Don't play office politics and be a divisive person. 
right? Learn to be a loyal friend. Don't be divisive with your little words over here, your little words over there, sowing discords. Be loyal where God has planted you. You know why? You, you know why? Because 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro and His eyes rest on the loyal. The favor of God cannot come upon you if you are a disloyal person. You say, I cannot be loyal in my company, then quit your company. I cannot be loyal in my group, then leave the group. Because don't let disloyalty rob you of the favor of God, of the blessing of God in your life. Christian maturity is really about, it's, it's about Christ-likeness. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So if you hunger and thirst to be like Jesus Christ, you'll be filled with all the fullness of God. And when I look back at all the revivals I've seen in our church, in all the different countries of Taiwan, that I got, or, or in Asia, you know, in different countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, that I have a, a little role to play and a privilege to be a part of, I can tell you this. Every revival is the result of the fullness of God. And it's only when we become like Jesus will we be filled with all the fullness of God. You believe that? Give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. You want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Number two, be intentional in unconditional love. Learn this year to love unconditionally, unconditionally. Learn to love unselfishly. I've been married for 28 years. My mom and dad, they've been married for 69 years. One more year, they'll be celebrating their platinum wedding anniversary. I can tell you this, and I, I learned from them, and I can tell you this from experience. A happy marriage is never 50-50. It's 100, 100. And it is not easy. It is for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. Now, I know we, we make this wedding vow. You know why? Because when we got married, we are young and we are in love. And we never imagined that our marriage will ever be difficult. But everyone that's been married for a long time, they will tell you there'll be many, many days in a marriage, where it seems like you're heading for the worst. And this is especially true when there are serious disagreement, or when there's insecurity and personality clashes, or there's cheating, or there's an affair, or there's an adultery, or maybe a chronic mental sickness. One of my good friends growing up, he married a childhood sweetheart, a beautiful Christian girl. Within months after their wedding, she had a serious nervous breakdown, had to be warded to IMH. And she was never quite the same after that. And he found out that it was a genetic hereditary problem. It ran in her family. But he didn't know, you see. He didn't expect that. It was a shock. From that point on, the wife was never quite the same. Her face changed, the way she talks changed, her voice changed. Never again would he have a deep, serious, spiritual conversation, heart-to-heart -heart conversation with her. Never again could they discuss about visions and dreams and how to handle the stress and challenges of their future. The wife was incapable of that. For the rest of her life, she has to be on psychotic medication. But my friend loved and cherished her like nothing happened. She was not exactly like the girl he had married. I saw that. I saw them before marriage and after marriage. But to him, he loved her like nothing has changed. And they've been happily married for 40 years. Oh, go ahead and give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, you want to clap this evening? Let's give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. This brother exemplified for me 
what a true marriage is. It is for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to death do us part. Marriage is a lifelong commitment. One of the greatest love stories in the Bible is the one between Hosea the prophet and Goma, his wife. See, Goma was a beautiful, beautiful girl. The name Goma literally means perfection. She was perfect. Perfect outwardly, perfect in her look, perfect in her mannerism, clever, intelligent. But she had a serious problem. She was very promiscuous and totally unfaithful in the marriage. Maybe Hosea was too busy with work, with ministry, and neglected her. It happens. Maybe after a few years of marriage, he let himself go. I mean, after all, in the Bible, Old Testament prophets tend to be very scruffy and unkempt. Kind of let himself go, became sloppy. Maybe Hosea was just, you know, he, he just neglected her. In any case, Goma had many affairs. She was a serial adulteress. She was pregnant three times. Two of the three kids were not Hosea's. How many of you men will stay married when your wife produced two out of three kids that's not yours? Hosea could because he knew something about love that most of us don't. As a prophet of God, he was very sensitive and very discerning. He was aware of her unfaithfulness and God showed him. And yet, his commitment to the relationship was absolute. Absolute. Her, his affection for her was unconditional. He kept loving her even in the midst of her affairs while he was aware of it. Hosea's love and forgiveness for Goma had no limit. He didn't at any time try to shame her, but instead chose to protect because love protects. Love covers and redeems her. So while everyone was howling and condemning the wife, Hosea said, even so, I will keep loving her again and again and again. Wow. God, look at his love. A love so great. God used Hosea to demonstrate his own love for his people, Israel. If God looks at all our love relationship, will God say, man, I'm going to use you to demonstrate this, how my love is like. I really want to encourage all you married couples. I know it is hard. It is hard to stay committed when there has been cheating, when there have been adulteries, especially if your spouse is cold and unresponsive. Worse still, you're not even sure if he or her is sorry and repentant. You don't feel the love anymore. And you may even feel you have married the wrong person. So for those of you who are married, I'm your pastor, I'm your spiritual father. Please, listen to me. Ephesians 5.25 says this, God wants the husband and the wife to love each other the way Jesus Christ loved his church. So this is how I must love son. And this is how son must love me. This is how you must love one another in marriage. The way Jesus loves us. So love and forgiveness, two sides of the same coin. Because there's no limit to love, there can be no limit to your forgiveness. No limit. Jesus forgave again and again. And he says, you got to forgive seven times seven. What does that mean? It's just a Hebrew idiom. means you always forgive. No conditions attached. You can't say, I will only forgive him if he does A, B, C, D, E. If he guarantees, if she guarantees A, B, C, D, E, then I'll forgive. Friends, there's no guarantee in love. 
Jesus loves us while we were yet sinners. When we were sinful and living in sin, His love and forgiveness has no limits, no conditions. Don't set a limit on how much you're willing to love or forgive or how long you're willing to wait. Because you say, at some point, enough is enough. Then I can tell you this, your love is not real. It's not true. You'll be willing to wait, even if there's no response from the other person. Oh, pastor, but I waited four to five years already. There's still no change. How much longer can I wait? Remember, it is for better or for worse. To death do us part. As long as you set limits and condition, what you have is not true love. Of course, if your spouse is unfaithful, you can divorce, right? You have the right. If there's adultery, there's cheating, you can divorce. You have the right. Jesus says it is permissible, but God's ways are higher than our ways. So what is God's ways? See, God's ways is like this. You can be unfaithful to me, I will still remain faithful to you. Unless you reject or renounce, if you reject and renounce Jesus totally, completely, and finally, He's going to stay with you, faithful all the way. Always loving, always serving, always patient, always waiting for you. Because in our relationship with Jesus Christ, He will never divorce us. Never. Jesus will never suggest divorce. So you must never be the one to suggest it or push for it. In fact, this is how I handle all my relationships. I will never cut anyone off unless you cut me off. If I'm your friend, I'm your friend for life. Unless you reject me and renounce this friendship, I will always be there and always be praying. If your spouse wants to divorce you and insist on it, it's a different story. But you decide today, you'll never be the one to suggest it or to push for it. But what happens when your spouse cannot love you romantically or affectionately anymore? Well, what happens when we can't love Jesus with all our hearts? And look, if you're all honest, we don't all love Jesus with all our hearts all the time, right? So what happened when we can't love Jesus with all our hearts? How would Jesus respond? Jesus says, okay, you can't love me the way I love you. Then just love me as a friend. Why don't we just be friends? Remember this, what he said to Peter. He said, Peter, can you agape me? Peter said, I can't. I, just, I can only love you superficially. He said, okay, let's just be friends. Let's just be friends. Remember that the person you got married to was your friend. Usually your best friend at one time. Sometimes when the loving feeling is gone, start by learning to be friends again. Start by being civil. Friends are civil. Careful with our words. You learn to talk. You learn to get along. You learn to be kind with your words. Love is the greatest motivator. All of us love God, not because we are so great, because He first loved us. His love moved us. To love Him. When you can sacrificially love, asking nothing in return, expecting nothing in return, 99% of the time, you can save the marriage. Jesus' love for Peter moved him so much. Eventually, in his old age, Peter willingly laid down his life and died for Christ. Because Jesus' love moved him. But pastor, what if my marriage is that 1%? You say 99% can be saved, but mine is that 1%. I'm suffering. I'm in pain. If I divorce now, maybe I can find my true soulmate out there. Maybe I will still have another chance at happiness. You mustn't think like that. Friends, 
there's a much higher purpose than romance and sex in life, in marriage. All these things are temporary. All these things are only pleasurable for this present age. We don't take our romance and sex to heaven. The greatest thing God wants to develop in your marriage is for you to learn true love. And true love is agape love. This is the love of heaven. This is how we love in the age to come. And God uses marriage to teach us. I know this is another level. It's quite hard. As long as we think, what's in this for me? I've been stuck in this marriage. You know, I've been, I've been bearing and bearing. What's in it? What do I get back in return? Every day I do my best. I fight for this family. I feed this family. I took care of this. I took... What's in it for me? Where is the happiness I deserve? Don't I deserve happiness? As long as you think like this, your love is selfish. Your love is conditional. In Ephesians 3, the verse that we saw earlier, when Paul prays that we become strong and powerful Christians, he goes on to pray that we will have a revelation, you will have a revelation of the width, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of Jesus Christ. And if you can love this way, that means love with no limits, you will be filled with all the fullness of God. How many of you want all the fullness of God, yeah? Some of you are not so sure anymore. <laughs> a love without limits. It is a love this world doesn't understand. Hollywood and Bollywood, they don't understand this. This is the kind of love that drove Jesus Christ to the cross. If we can love like this, we will be filled with all the fullness of God. And God uses your marriage to teach you this. And then a very strange thing happens. Even if your spouse is unresponsive, when you can love with no limits, all of a sudden, the fullness of God brings with it a heavenly joy, a heavenly satisfaction and fulfillment. There will be a joy unspeakable and full of glory. You can have the fulfillment in God that is greater than romance and sex or children or companionship. So when you are in pain and you can't think straight, you must trust God and you must trust what He says in the Word that what He says will come to pass. If you can love with the love of Christ, the width, the length, the depth, and the height, you will be filled with all the fullness of God. You will have a life that is fulfilling and satisfying. Come on, give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Oh, you want to clap? Let's give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Remember, we are not married for eternity. It's just for this lifetime. And in the light of eternity, your marriage, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, is just like a drop in the ocean. All the joy of romance and sex and companionship cannot be compared to the joy we cannot get when we go to heaven. C.S. Lewis says this, I told you before, in heaven, the highest raptures of earthly lovers will be as milk and water compared with the delights of knowing God. One of our THN senior pastors had a near-death experience recently. She was in a coma and she almost died. And in that state, in her coma, her soul went up to heaven. She had a heavenly encounter. She said that when she was in heaven, she realized one thing. In her life, the greatest Love, the greatest pleasure of love is found in the husband. She loved her husband like nothing else. She cannot imagine experiencing any love greater than the love she had for the husband. He said, but in the presence of Jesus, the heavenly joy is so great and overwhelming and ecstatic. He said, it made the love in her marriage felt so pale and insignificant. 
it was like nothing compared to the joy of being in heaven. So Jesus told her and said, you need to go back. Your time is not yet. You're not going to die. You go back to your body. You know, she said, no, no, Jesus, don't send me back. The joy and the delight of God's presence was so awesome, she didn't want to go back. No wonder Paul said, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. And she, he would rather be present with Jesus. So she, she came to Singapore and visited us. And she told Sun and I, say, the joy of my husband is my greatest pleasure. But it's nothing compared to the joy of being in the presence of Jesus in heaven. Let me tell you, one day you and I are going to experience that. So yes, there is pain, there's hardship. But God is teaching you how to love unconditionally because the more you can love like Jesus today, the more your pleasure and your joy in heaven one day. You will experience that just the act of loving alone in itself is satisfying and fulfilling enough. You see, one of the greatest joys for me every day is to drive my boy, little Dayan, to school. He's not little anymore. Every time I say little, when son says, look, he's a teenager, a huge teenager. He's not just a teen, he's huge. I've been doing this ever since he was in preschool for 10 over years. Every morning I wake up, wake him up, drive him to school. I enjoy that very much. It is my daily quiet time with my son, even though half the time he's asleep. Sometimes I'm driving, I'm talking to him, and hello, Dan, Dan, and <laughs> he's asleep. <laughs> but I consider it a high privilege, because how many years can I do this? So sometimes, son said, you are very tired, Kong, you know, you had a long line, why don't I drive? I said, no, 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 no one is going to take away the joy of me driving my son. Because in a few more years, he'll be driving his own son. <laughs> I won't have the chance anymore. So one day while I was driving... I wondered, I asked Jesus, I said, why is it so fun, so joyful, so satisfying to drive my son even though I'm tired? And then I realized, this is what agape love is all about. Loving alone must be enough. And that's why agape, when you love with agape love, the act of loving is satisfying enough. Any positive response from day and it's an added bonus to me. So every single day, I want to love my wife. I want to love son. So three times a day, I want to give her her love multi vibes. You remember? Attention, all right? appreciation, affection. Three times a day. I want to I'll go ahead and give God a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the privilege. Amen. Amen. Now, any response from her is an added bonus. The ability, the joy, the privilege of expressing love to my spouse is joy in itself. This is what agape love is. We need to come to that. Every single week, to be able to come and serve you, to be able to preach, is a great privilege. If you are nice to me and say, Pastor, you preach well, you say, I had a bonus. <laughs> but listen, I don't preach for a response. The ability to preach and the ability to serve, the ability to be your pastor is reward enough in itself. Friends, this is the agape love. Jesus Christ wants to teach all of us here every single day. To love unconditionally, unselfishly. When we can love like Jesus in the same width, the same length, the same depth, and the same height, the fullness of God will guarantee in us a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, for those of you who are single, I know I talk about marriage like this, you got scared, right? You're saying, oh, pastor, you know, I think I don't want to get married. Don't be afraid of marriage. But at the same time, those of you who are single, don't be pressured into it. Don't be pressured. Jesus was single. Paul was single. 
Many of the apostles were single. So if you're single, you learn to love your family. You love your parents, your siblings, your church mates, your cell group leader. Maybe even try your pastor, right? You love with the love of God. Learn to love unselfishly. Learn to love with no conditions. Learn to forgive and forgive and forgive and be patient and be kind and be tender and be gentle and be encouraging. Learn to de derive fulfillment simply by the act of loving itself with no expectation of any positive response. If it comes, it comes. It's an added bonus. If you can love like this, the love of God will take you to the fullness of God's joy. So over the next 12 months, I want you to be very intentional and very focused in these things. Number one, you cultivate Christ-likeness. Number two, you learn unconditional love. I tell you, it's going to be very hard, but you try. And when you do what Jesus says, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, because in 2021, He wants to fill you more and more with the fullness of God. A revival is coming. The next wave of God is coming. I don't know how long this time of preparation is going to be, but I know this. If we want to be in a position for the next, for God's best, we got to be filled with the fullness of God. Are you ready for the fullness of God? If you are, give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, come on, go ahead and give the Lord a big clap. Amen. Number three, the third thing, final thing. This is your vision. Be intentional in marketplace discipleship. What do I mean? Be intentional in marketplace discipleship. God has planted us here to be salt and light in the world, right? We have a cultural mandate to be relevant, to be authentic, to be useful in the marketplace, for the marketplace, to bring the kingdom of God in the marketplace. Nothing has changed. His command is His command. His mandate is His mandate. But this COVID-19 pandemic has given us the chance to pause and renew and refresh our vision and our commitment to marketplace evangelism. So let's be clear with our mission. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to be clear with your mission. Come on, just stand there right now. Listen, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So, in other words, we got to be different in our spiritual values from the world in order to make a difference in the world. If you want to make a difference in the world, there got to be something that's different to make that difference. So your goal cannot just be to be rich and famous, to make money, to be wealthy, to buy a bigger house, buy a fancier car, to have a greater position, promotion, prestige, to find more pleasure and more comfort. If that is your goal, you're no different from everyone else. If our focus is on the kingdom of God and all His righteousness, how many of you know all the things that we need will be added to us? The success, the blessing. All these things will come. So what is our goal then? Your goal must be to be a disciple of Jesus. Showing forth Jesus. Winning people to Christ in the marketplace or in the campus that God has put you in. We mustn't think that to shine for Jesus, we got to be rich and famous and wealthy and a successful business. You can't take all your money and your fame into eternity. Oh, but pastor, if I can just be a millionaire or a billionaire and be rich and, and successful and have lots of money, then people will look at me and can point them to Jesus. I'll be a witness for Jesus. That is a very convenient excuse to cover up greed and materialism. You got to be careful here. It is true, success and wealth gives us a platform to share our faith. The Bible says nobody is going to listen to a failure. 
Nobody is going to listen to somebody who is not making it. But inherent in the desire to be rich and famous is a lot of greed and a lot of pride. So you got to realize this. Success can come from two sources. It can come from God or it can come from Satan. Yeah? The devil can give success. Remember, the devil turned to Jesus and said, if you bow down and worship me, all the glories of the world, I'm going to give it to you. So make no mistake about it. The devil can also give you money and riches, success and fame. So what is the difference? The difference is this. The Bible says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Proverbs 10 and verse 22. So if there's trouble in your life, you're struggling with affairs, cheating. You're struggling with adultery. There's no more energy for you to do your quiet time. You're so busy from morning to night because your job requires you to be busy. You have no strength to read the Bible, to pray, to fellowship yourself. No time for Zoom. Zoom fatigue. No time for, for church. No time for fellowship. I mean, you have no time for all these things. Your idea of relaxing is drinking. It's going to the pub. It's going to the club. You're compromising your values. You're straying from Jesus. Your children is rebellious, estranged from God, angry with God. Then you've got to ask yourself, is your fame and success from God? Because it certainly doesn't sound like it's from God. The riches and wealth, it's not from the Lord. Because when God blesses, there's no sorrow, there's no trouble. Jesus says, what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It's not worth it. It's not worth it to be the most successful and richest person in your family and lose your soul. If you want to be Jesus' disciple, he says, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, every day, and follow me. I like what Pastor Kim Hock says recently. He says, if we want to do our Father's business, we need three things, kingdom-mindedness, heavenly affection, and a crucified will. I like that very much. <laughs> so amazed. <laughs> My own disciple came up with such an amazing thing. I learned so much. Kingdom-mindedness, heavenly affection, and a crucified will. I want to end this service by sharing two words with you that you seldom hear of before. So at least you can go back home and people ask you, what do you learn today? You can learn some new theological words strengthened in your doctrine, right? Two words, mortification and vivification. Can we all try that? Everybody say mortification. mortification. I can't hear you say mortification. mortification. Say vivification. vivification. And we need both. If we want to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. Now, mortification is the progressive killing of sin as it manifests itself in us. It's the progressive killing of sin as it manifests itself. So we kill every rebellious habit, every self-indulgent habit as they surface in our lives and they will keep on surfacing. 45 years, and it's still surfacing all the time. So we kill pride. We kill lust. We kill envy. We kill anger. We kill greed. Kill it. <laughs> That's modification. Vivification is the inculcating and strengthening of Christ-like habits in us. The inculcating, the strengthening of Christ-like habits, specifically the nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So, to follow Jesus and be His disciples in the marketplace, in our campuses, we need to seek the kingdom of God. We need both. 
the positive side is vivification, growing and maturing in the new man, in the new creation. The negative side is mortification, killing and weakening the old man. When you can do this too, and seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, I guarantee you, success will follow. Money will follow. The money will come, the breakthrough, the promotion, the favor. All these things will come. Because that success comes from the Lord. That blessing that makes one rich comes from the Lord. So in every project, every business venture, we must learn to ask Jesus, what do you have for me to do in this? Not my will, but yours be done. Every single day. How can I glorify you in my workplace? How can I glorify you in my campuses? How can I share your goodness and greatness so that people can know who you are? So as we wait out for our COVID-19 pandemic, let this be your vision. Three things today. Number one, intentional in cultivating Christ-likeness. Learn to be patient and kind and gentle. Deal with your anger problem. No more losing your temper this year. Try, try. No more gossiping this year. You try, right? Develop self-control. Number two, be intentional in loving unconditionally. Learn to love with no limits, no condition. Learn to forgive and forgive and forgive all the time. And learn to derive heavenly joy just by loving alone without needing any positive response from the object of your love. Number three, be intentional in marketplace discipleship. Be sure your wealth and your success is from the Lord. It's not from the kingdom of darkness. Focus on your spiritual growth. Focus, vivification, mortification. Focus on winning people to Christ in the marketplace, in the campuses. We are a few years away from the next mighty move of God that I believe will astound all of us. But this is the period of preparation. How many of you are going to join me in this journey to prepare ourselves to be more like Jesus? Wait, wait, before you clap, how many of you want to be more like Jesus? If you want to be more like Jesus, lift up both hands and wave at me. Can we just give the Lord a big hand right now? Hallelujah. Let's all stand out on our feet. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Those of you that are watching online, I want you to stand on your feet right now. Let's just begin to open our mouth and just begin to pray in the Spirit right now. Hallelujah. We can pray, we can pray, we can cry out to the Lord. Those of you at home, just pray. Those of you in this hall, just pray right now. Just cry out to God in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. We want to be more like You, O oh God. We want to be more like You, O oh God. We want to love like You, O oh Lord. We want to love unconditionally, agape love. We want to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God. Oh God.
hallelujah. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, with my strength. I will love you. I will love you, Lord, with my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is everywhere King Jesus can rule and reign. So when we say we seek His kingdom first and all His righteousness, it means God, we, we are opening our life so that you can come and rule and reign in my character, in how I live, how I respond, in how I love, in my marriage, in my relationship, in my business, in the marketplace, in the campus. Jesus, you come and rule and reign in my life. How many of you want to allow Him to come and rule? See, God respond as we respond. He, that He will grant you that you will have understanding, a revelation of the width, of the length, of the depth, of the height, of the love of Christ, that He could fill you with the fullness of God. See, God responds if our desire, our direction is in that area. How many of you one Jesus to reign in your life. Amen. One more time. Why don't we just sing it? Hallelujah. Our God reign. Just tell Him this evening. Just, just begin to pray in the Spirit right now. Those of you at home, just open your mouth and begin to pray. We can cry out to God. We can reach out to Him. Heaven is open this evening. Hallelujah. Just open your mouth and begin to pray in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, we worship You. Jesus, we praise You. Come and reign. Come and rule in our lives. Hallelujah. I wonder how many of you tonight say, Jesus, I want you to rule and reign in the way I live my life. You have an anger problem that you cannot bring under control. There are a lot of frustration, a lot of bitterness, a lot of resentment. Maybe you're impatient. Maybe you need gentleness. Maybe you need kindness. Maybe the areas in your life, the, the working checklist that the Bible has given to us, the character profile of Jesus. You say, Lord, I fall short of that. I have not been focusing on that. I focus on the external, but I neglected the internal. I'm so busy with so many things, but I have not tended to my own vineyard. And tonight you say, God, I want you to do a work in my life. I want you to change me to make me more like Jesus. Every night when I come home from work, 
Let it be that my children, my family members, my spouse will look as if Jesus just walked right in. Every day when I go to the office, it will be as if they see Jesus walking in. Help me, Lord, to be more like you. I want to be intentional in cultivating Christ-likeness in 2021. How many of you say, Pastor, that's me? If that's you, we just lift up your hands all over this room right now. That's right. What is that one area you need to surrender to God? Is it impatience? Is it a lack of gentleness? Is it anger and frustration? Will you surrender to God today? How many of you, maybe you say, this year I, I need to love unconditionally more and more. I need to love like Jesus. I need to be able to come to the place of agape love where I can love without expecting a positive response. And I will still love and I will forgive. I will derive joy and satisfaction from God because I know I'm loving the way He loves. I'm loving the way heaven loves. I'm, I'm walking in the atmosphere of heaven. Sometimes you're so frustrated because we don't feel appreciated. We don't feel appreciated in our workplace. We don't feel appreciated at home. We don't feel appreciated in our marriage. We don't feel appreciated in ministry, in church, in a cell group. And there's a lot of anger and frustration. Today, surrender it to Jesus. Surrender it. Today, you say, Jesus, I'm coming up higher. I want to love the way you love. I want to live the way you live. If that's you, wherever you are, just lift up your hands right now, all over this room. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Everyone sing. Hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever. One third thing, the third part of this vision that God has for us for 2021. And that is we're going to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus. Yes, we want success. Yes, we want favor. We want promotion. We want 2021 to be better than 2020. We want to be debt free. We want to come to a place where we are living in the blessing and abundance of God. But we don't want a success to come from Satan. We don't want a success that comes from the devil. A success that will cause us to stray in our hearts. A success that will make us hush and bitter. A success that will make us losing our consecration. We say, Jesus, I want a success that comes from heaven. I want a success that's a result of me seeking your kingdom and your righteousness first. That this success it's an addition from the presence of the Lord. I'm not focusing on it, but it comes as a blessing because my focus is on you. Yes. And this is whether you're, whether you're here on site or you're at home watching on the internet, this is for you. Don't be fixated by money, fame and riches and wealth. All those things, they are blessings from the Lord but you got to make sure that it really comes from God. How many of you say, God, I, I want to deny myself every self-indulgent habit, every selfish, prideful, greedy desire, I surrender to Jesus. And today you want to be a disciple of the Lord. You want to be a disciple of the Lord. If that's you, wherever you are, just lift up your hands one more time, right? Hallelujah. I want everybody... Everyone say this prayer out loud together with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. I want to embrace your vision. I want to embrace your vision. This year, I want to be more like Jesus. This year, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to see the fruit of the Spirit. I want to see the fruit of the Spirit. Growing in my life. Growing in my life. I want to love unconditionally. I want to love unconditionally. To love like Jesus. To love like Jesus. At home. At home. In my marriage. In my marriage. In my relationships. In my relationships. Let loving alone be enough. Let loving alone be enough. Help me to be forgiving. Help me to be forgiving. To be patient and kind. To be patient and kind. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Help me to be a disciple. Help me to be a disciple. 
Help me to follow Jesus every day. Help me to follow Jesus every I day. I deny every pride. I deny every pride. Every greed. Every greed. Every lust. Every lust. Every envy. Every envy. I embrace your glory. I embrace your glory. I embrace your presence. I embrace your presence. Lift up your hands and talk to God right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cannot sing, but we can pray. All over this room, just open your mouth and pray. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus, help us, Lord. Jesus, help us, Lord. Help us to be more like you. Help our cell group to be more Christ-like. Help us, oh God, to love one another unconditionally. Help us this year to follow Jesus. Let the blessing, the promotion, the favor come from you. Our focus is on the Lord. Our focus is on your will. Not my will, but yours be done. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Help us all to be more and more like you. Every single person, every brother, every sister in this place, those that are watching on the internet, I pray this year, oh God, help us really to manage our anger. Help us to manage our frustration. Help us, oh God, this year to be kinder, to be gentler. Help us this year to be patient. Help us to season our words with salt, with lots of love. Help us to always be encouraging. Take away every negative attitude in our hearts. Lord, I just pray 2021, we will always believe the best in one another, hoping for the best, believing and trusting and praying for the best in each other. Lord, I pray this year, let that be the agape love, overflowing, overflowing from the deep within us, overflowing in our marriage, in our relationship, in our family life. Lord, I just pray, take away all the frustration, all the anger. Once again, I pray, let the love flow. Let the love of God flow upon every marriage right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, unconditional love, unconditional love. Lord, unconditional forgiveness. We constantly walk in the atmosphere of forgiveness. Father, I pray this year, raise a more marketplace disciples. Lord, this year, we are different. We are different to make a difference. Lord, we are sword and light in this world. I pray, let there be a new consecration from the front to the back upon everyone that's watching on the internet right now. On every family represented, every cell group represented, we don't live, we declare we don't live for fame or riches, for popularity, for money. Lord, we live for the Lord. We live for the gospel. Yes, Lord. Help us to be more like you, we pray. Just pray in tongues right now. Just pray a little bit more. Shuduria la karabaha deria la karabaha deria la karabaha deria Shuduria la karabaha deria Just press into God Something is happening Those of you on the, uh, online Just pray, just pray, just pray In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ Shuduria la karabaha deria la karabaha deria la karabaha deria Oh God, oh God Fill us with the fullness of God With all the fullness of God Jesus, make us more like you. When last time we sing, oh, Hallelujah, our God reigns. Lift up your hands, lift up your hearts. Oh, hallelujah, our God reigns. Hallelujah, our God reigns forever. believe that 
give the Lord a big hand. Hallelujah. The Bible says, clap your hands, all your people. Come on, let's give him a big clap offering. It's deep calling unto the deep. Lord, we respond to all you are. We respond to who you are. Let's sing it one last time. One last time. Will you just fist bump your neighbors in your left and right and say, this is going to be your best year yet. Just tell them that right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you.